Yo, welcome to the season finale of Life of Bam Margera, guys. Today, we got a lot to talk about, all right? We're mostly just going to focus on CKY4 and the Jackass movie. 2002 was one of Bam's busiest years. Uh, so busy that I'm going to have to separate some of the topics for the next episode, such as the continuation of CKY's music career and the filming of Haggard. Jackass Season 3 has some misinformation on its release date. While some sources mention Season 3 airing from December to February, this isn't 100% confirmed. The best release date would probably be from June to August of 2001. One. Looking back at the Jackass Companion book written by Sean Cliver, he states on page 20, The day after the last episode of the third season aired in August 2001, a new story broke with statements by Knoxville, claiming that Jackass was officially over and done with. This came as a bit of a shock to MTV. Several months of meetings, phone calls, and negotiations later, the idea of a movie was born and settled upon by all pertinent parties. The only stipulation made on the producer's behalf was that it to be rated an unequivocal R. The cast has all gone about their individual ways. Knoxville was scoring movie roles, Bam was making CKY and Haggard, Dave England proved the doctors wrong and had a baby girl, Aaron moved to California, and Steve-O was headlining shows with the likes of Pontius, Wee Man, Preston, and Dunn. Transitioning from a 21-minute episodic series to a multi-million full-length feature film would not be a simple task. Hey Rick, it's the red tab right next to the thing. You, man, if you know how this works, what's going on here? It's the red tab on top. It's not working to me, too. Changes were going to need to be made to accommodate to the increase in budget and legality. No longer a simple handy cam venture of a few dozen, the crew would be in need to hire Kevin Roberts, a professional cameraman to work with the newly provided digital beta cams. Taken more seriously would be the legal and safety regulations. A whole legal department would look over any ideas for the film after being approved by a producer. Then a safety department would advise counsel to the crew, quoting the companion book, They remind us that we are all frail little meat puppets by filling in the more technical gaps in our reality deficit imagination, along with necessary cleanup measures required by law when dealing with our favorite biohazardous family. Lastly, planning would organize a five-month calendar of events to keep production within continuity and on schedule for a fall release. They came to the conclusion of filming in five locations from January to May of 2002, with the locations being the Pacific Northwest, Westchester, Japan, Florida, and finishing it all off in California. Jackass the Movie would be set to premiere October 21st, 2002. Parents and family play a big part in the development of values, but friends do too. <laughs> <laughs> Parents often worry their teenager is running with the wrong crowd and could do something to regret later and be patient and trust them, they won't let you down. <laughs> all right? <laughs> Audio Footwear was a skate shoe company created in 1998 by skateboard legend Chris Miller. It didn't take them long to sign Bam Margera with a sponsorship for the brand. And in June of 2001, Audio published an article announcing the premiere of a new skate tape called One Step Beyond at an ASR trade show in San Diego at the Horton Plaza Theater. After which, Planet Hollywood across the street would host a performance by CKY and the Blockheads. Apparently, according to the article, one of the CKY members actually got into a fight over a girl and wound up in the hospital that night. I'm not sure who, uh, there's not much I could find on this, but I thought that was kind of interesting. Bam got a lot of screen time for this project. His spotlight was one of the first in the tape, using the track Du Hast by Rammstein, legally this time. He toured with Tony Hawk, who commented on traveling with Bam. Being with Bam is always a lot of fun, but it's kind of unnerving because you never know what he's going to be up to and what kind of trouble everyone's going to get in because of it. Bam's segment would feature the usual CKY clips, newer attempts like jumping onto trees, uh, the shopping cart launches, you know, jumping into things. He also used a hymn track that was found on Razorblade Romance. We also get to see Bam ollie off of a diving platform, crashing golf carts, FDR footage, the usual works. Honestly, you could go without watching this in your binge, but if you're into skate tapes, I highly recommend it. Bam already had Haggard late into production by February of 2002. During this, Audio announced exclusive CKY model shoes. This is a co-op venture between BAM and the crew. The information here is rather foggy. Also sponsored by Audio was the second annual BAM Margera X Games Bash. Much like last year, this would be the premiere of CKY4 on August 17th, 2002. Sadly, I couldn't find much information on this. 
CKY4's VHS would be released on November 10th, 2002, and the DVD on March 25th, 2003. CKY4 has quite a few controversies in its history, which is why there's about four pressings of CKY4 that I'm aware of. And the cut content is rather memorable too. The intro track for CKY4 is You Think I Ain't Worth a Dollar But I Feel Like a Millionaire by Queens of the Stone Age, which was a very interesting choice on the part of BAM. We get thrown into a lot of content in the intro, and the production quality is very noticeable. And on the DVD, the HD is gorgeous. I like to point out the scene where Tony Hawk pulls up to pick up BAM in his Lambo, and BAM just is like, bruh, what are you doing? Get in the passenger seat. And then he smacks Tony's ass? So in 2014, MTV premiered CKY's Greatest Hits, a documentary going through the history of CKY. It's a really good watch, guys. I wish I would have watched this sooner. The documentary just adds so much additional content on certain stunts and moments, which mentions the historic day that Rab pissed on an electric fence. If you pee on an electric fence, the electric goes back into your penis. And we're gonna separate fact from fiction. Not much I can show you on this, all right? But I'm gonna throw out any speculation on this being fake. This totally seems like something they would do. And here's what Chris Rabb had to say during his interview with True Exact Radio. The way I could explain it is like, it's like, you know that feeling like if you stick your finger in the socket? Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. It's not too bad. It's just like, Ugh. it's like that. But then it was like that on my dick. But then I was very like, is that gonna... <laughs> Make it not work. So I was freaked out about that, but the, but the main thing was the uh, feeling in my teeth. So oh, it yeah. felt like it felt like I was chewing on tinfoil. Like, I don't know what's going on in my mouth. You know, like so that was the part that was weird. Was like this like tinfoil like felt like I was chewing on tinfoil and my feelings or something like. CKY4 would also be the debut of Narkill, Bam and Deco's satire project. This synth pop esque band featured Bam on keyboard, Rick Vos on guitar, Deco improvising on vocals, Matt Cole on mixing, and Jess on drums. In 2003, they released a self titled record featuring the songs in both Haggard and CKY4. One track not featured on the record, but was in CKY4, was Eat My Fuck, a CKY collaboration track. For this 40 second music video, we get to see their use of the Painted Castle from CKY3, a truly classic bop that reminds me of Thunderkiss 65 by White Zombie. We also get two additional Narkill music videos in CKY4, one being Mustard Man. This, as I'm sure you know, is a rib on Raytheon's dramatic hatred of mustard. The music video features Bam, Deco, and Jess performing in a room entirely covered in yellow, with bottles of mustard located on the cabinets behind them. Meanwhile, Raytheon is seen holding hands with Mustard Girl which was actually just Rab in a yellow dress and wig. She is taken away from Rake by Mustard Man, played by Lord Bataro. I don't know if I mentioned Lord Bataro yet, but here it is. I mean, Rake's just like, ew, 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 the whole time. Yeah, it's my I don't girlfriend. Ew, ew, this is stupid. Ew, all this yellow. Oh my god. Lord Bataro met Jess through Darren at the Battle of the Bands when Jess had the band bored to death and Darren had the band This End Up. Where, where need be. Well, well, I always got called in when someone didn't show up. Yeah, oh, that, yeah, yeah. that's who I yeah, was. Yeah, well, well, you got called in in uh, Graphic Arts with Captain Undies, right? <laughs> they used to hang out by the third floor steps at East High School. Later on in life, Lord Bataro would study to become a chef. In addition, he would be Deco's roommate and would be called in if needed at the last minute for certain bits. Rab pointed out on the podcast that Lord Bataro did not hold back during that music video. So this next one is only on the first pressing. It's called He-Man vs. Skeletor, which was about the homoerotic relationship between Beastman and Skeletor during which Deco would dress up as both characters. The bit was one of Deco's finest. While Bam jams on the keyboard, Deco's freestyle would be accompanied with stop motion of the He-Man action figures. And this bit is a must-see. It's sad to say, but this bit resulted in a cease and desist letter by Maddle. So, Maddle is one of those companies with a really shady history. Um, they have a very aggressive legal department that is known for frivolous lawsuits. 
In the late 2010s, accusations were made for workplace bullying in the form of harassment, age discrimination, retaliation, and wrongful termination. But not only that, guys. In 1971, Mattel had lied on their financial statements by falsely reporting unfilled purchase orders as sales. So, I guess CKY just messed with the wrong company here, and they just ended up complying with the cease and desist letter. Which was quite a shame, man. I, this video has been one of the best they've done in the series, and just got shot down. I guess this is a safe time to mention Narkill's Ottomans Recording Hell, aka Brand's Freestyles, a 17-track CD featuring Deco's improv talent. All the tracks were recorded in Bam's basement throughout 2002. This featured Deco's various accents and impressions, and if you're into Deco's accents, you'd probably like this. Some tracks are just a bit hit and miss, and it, it, it's silly and it's simple, but I think some of the impressions are just outdated. I, I'd recommend at least listening to it once again just to get the exposure to that deco energy. Regardless, the CD itself is on the rarer side of the CKY iceberg, and it's worth quite a pretty penny on eBay. CKY4 featured several scenes of people confronting Bam and his friends while street skating. One worth mentioning involved a landscaper in a parking lot while they were skating at night. The guy dogged that he is the one that has to repair the damages that they cause. However, he made the mistake of pushing his authority onto the anti-authority complex of Mike Vallely. Yo, 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 stop, stop. Dude, 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 Why do you think like you're in charge of this? All you are is a landscaper. Don't get my face, man. He continuously got into Mike's face until Mike retaliated by grabbing him by the throat and telling him to leave. The dude obliged and left ending the rather jarring scene. This scene has a particular interesting fan theory. A bulldozer. Some pointed out that this is the exact guy that could be seen in a bulldozer on season one, episode three of Evil La Bam. It's a bit of a stretch, but I think it's kind of a neat connection. Following CKY3, Rab himself would earn the nickname Shit Guy by many of the CKY fans. He lives up to this in CKY4. One incident was when he shat on a glass wall at a bar and grill in New York City while someone was eating. Another bit, he got out of a van and shat in front of somebody just chilling on the curb. And lastly, he shat while in a van going 70 miles per hour on the highway. And he missed quite a bit. Sad to say though, CKY4 is when Rab's alcoholism becomes quite noticeable. Rab, you're going up to get hoard dirt, dude. You're fing dead meat. He used to tour with the CKY band quite frequently and would miss class just to party with them. It got so bad that he ironically got three D's and an F one semester, while his character in Haggard did the same thing. F this time, normally they get all B's. But how ironic is it that he has three D's and an F because of the script? All just because I fucking said that line. It jinxed the fuck out of me and now I got... One of the pressings of CKY4 featured an exclusive scene involving Chad Ginsburg visiting the grave of Gigi Allen. All right, we gotta go down a rabbit hole for a second, guys, because there's a lot to say about Gigi Allen, and you gotta understand who Gigi Allen is to really understand this whole scene. On one hand, he was known as a punk rock prodigy. He was an advocate of punk rock culture, and he was contributing his narcissistic, nihilistic point of view on a global and national scale. These people over here would rather shelter their kids they would rather censor them, they would rather keep them from the real world, and those are the very people that stalkers, world, Gigi. people say, yes I you am, what you, see at, my, what you see at my show, you'll see you're on the street, the real world. you'll see what's no. happening in urban America, not in no. Thailand, John. You are, you are a night. On the other hand, he sort of was everything else. Gigi Allen was known for his acts of danger music and shock rock. Uh, during his performances, he would commit transgressive acts that involved harming himself, defecating, you know, plans to off himself, nudity, violence towards everything and everyone. I like no. to ask Mr. Gigi Allen, how do you hurt people and say that they deserve it? I mean, uh, because what kind of human being are you? It'll make them stronger. If I hurt somebody, chances are they're going to be much more defensive. If somebody comes and beats the out of me, if somebody comes at me the second time, it's not going to happen. However, I don't really think we should idolize Gigi Allen. There was a psychiatric report of Gigi Allen which was filed in 1989 when he was in prison. He was described as showing features of mixed personality disorder with borderline narcissistic and masochistic features 
murders. This could be also kind of be seen as a big mental health story as well. But in 1993, at the age of 36, Gigi Allen passed away of a heroin overdose. And now, in 2002, Chad Ginsburg is here to visit his grave the way Gigi Allen would have wanted it, down a whole bottle of Jim Bean and piss all over it. And so naturally, Chad just got tremendously wasted during this. Chad would just talk a lot of incoherent shit on camera. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, I watched a really interesting documentary on Gigi Allen. Um, here, here's what it is. I can't remember the name right now. It's on YouTube. It's a very good, interesting watch, and I hope you guys enjoy it. But anyway, back, back to the video, so. Chester County was a bit about the history of Westchester County, narrated by Deco. This one I'm not really a fan of. It's just Deco saying profanity over black and white portraits of Westchester founding fathers, while also mentioning Rake Yan and Lord Bartaro. Uh, that's pretty much it. But to Lord Bartaro's surprise, when he undid the senator's trousers, a mere log fell out. It, it's kind of lackluster to me, I'm sorry guys. Paintball shit fuck though, was a bit funnier. Bill gets off work in 15 minutes. And I have 20 paintballs up in his yacht. He's gonna fucking die. And prior to this, he shot himself into the foot and reacted accordingly. Bam just then decides to put all of his pain out on his dad. Not just by shooting him several times, but also shooting Phil in the foot at the end. I felt like this. Ow, damn! The cover for CKY4 features Ryan Dunn, aka Random Hero, performing a stunt that involved rolling down a hill in a barrel. The twist being he has his arm and head sticking outside of the barrel. The scene began with an attempt by Jen, who had a pillow for safety. She was okay, and that's when Dunn stepped in. Dunn did the stunt and landed back first, shrieking, Oh my god, my fucking goddamn spine. <laughs> it wasn't good. There's also a scene where the group goes to war. One thing worth mentioning is Rab dying and holding on to Deco for help, but everyone just sort of agrees that he's dead and just leaves. We get tons of shots of the crew firing guns while various sound clips play. Uh, Deco's death scene is, is pretty dramatically comical. <laughs> As for the poker scene, it didn't really make a lot of sense to me. So the group is playing cards while drinking wine and smoking cigars. Who can fuck a bat chat? Well, I guess I'm out. And you owe me $800. I'll, I'll pay you back. Also, Novak bets his rosary his grandmother gave him and loses it to Deco. He's not okay with it. Look at that! <laughs> you win it, yeah. Oh, 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 also, Don is seen drinking wine with a cigar in his mouth, and he spills it all over the oblivious pupper on his lap. Then we get a sudden shot of Ryan fucking what we believe to be Deco's wife, resulting in Deco to snap at him. I really didn't find this scene all that funny, and I was kind of confused. Like, at first I thought it was a deleted scene to Haggard, but I don't know, it doesn't make any sense to me. So what do you guys think about a theory I have, that Bam idolized Vil Valo so much that he's almost trying to be him? Because I began to think about this during the him music video bit that featured Bam in his fur coat, top hat, he's got eyeliner, the and his notorious him belt buckle on. And there's just this aura of edginess that maybe even like, maybe even a little pretentious in a sense, just like given off by him in this bit. Anyway, this segment featured clips and stunts both new and old, and it was entertaining despite featuring a lot of stuff that I've already seen. And with that being said, a lot of CKY4's featured material was rather Rather, recycled moments from previous CKYs and the Jackass TV series, such as beating up Phil, an extended version of the stunt The Hole, the segment I can't talk about with Rab and Dunn, and of course the gigantic skate park tour and feature from both Pro Skater 3 and Audio One Step Beyond. Honestly, it wasn't really noticeable to me until just recently, and the amount of fresh content still holds everything together quite nicely. The credits to CKY4 would feature the track 
Burn by the Bloodhound Gang. During this, Bam thanked Jimmy Pop for helping him sign him to a US label. At the time, him was in the middle of a name dispute with a Chicago avant-garde jazz fusion band of the same name, just with a lowercase i. Him ended up calling themselves her in the states for a little bit. This was due to the threat of legal action by the Chicago band. Apparently the band was not interested in sharing their name with the Finnish band. The frontman of the band, Doug, stated in the article, uh, their hymn stands for His Infernal Majesty. I'm seriously opposed to it, man. And as far as I can make it out, we had the name first. This feud is probably why Bam mentions that the band sucks and that we shouldn't confuse the two, which is an understandable response since Bam really loves Valo and is probably not the biggest fan of avant-garde jazz. But it, it doesn't matter, this, is, this all doesn't matter because in March of 2003, the bands reached an agreement of less than 300,000 and so they both were able to share the label. So in the credits, Bam and Jimmy Pop would slap each other around until, until taking their drunk antics to the parking lot once again for some shopping cart slams. Rab would end up cutting his hand in this bit, and uh, Jimmy responds by saying that in order to fix Rab, they have to uh, run Rab into a soda machine. I got so worked by that shopping cart like so many different ways. I broke my tailbone in the shopping cart. I got multiple concussions. I got another concussion. Um, when I smacked my head into the uh, soda machine, we were hanging out with Bloodhound Gang, and I think it was Jimmy that was, uh, Jimmy Pop was pushing, and, uh, and he was like, dude, he was all nervous, and I, and I, so then I kept giving him, like, stop being a fucking pussy and just do it, you know, like, and he was like, because he's like pushing like real light, and I was like, dude, that's not what we're trying to do. So then he was like, all right, and, and he fucking pushed super hard, and I went flying, and I ended up, um, I smacked my elbow so hard that I displaced my ulna nerve. So it went outside of this little bone. So it was just out there. So then I, I was supposed to have surgery, but they were like, look, if you have surgery, the post credits featured the crew playing tennis, Don Vito drinking 52 shots of peach schnapps. Also, that had the intro track to Viva La Bam playing. I thought that was kind of interesting. Old footage of antiquing, Brand's Icelandic game show, which I think is from CKY2. But what takes the cake for me is the Easter eggs found in the DVD menu. To access the Easter eggs, go to the bonus features. Press right until the red text disappears. Then press left and right again, and the DVD cover to CKY2 will flip and reveal some bonus scenes. We get footage of Deco dressing up as Benjamin Franklin. He attempts to use a kite in a rainstorm to relearn electricity. I harness onto them the electricity that flows through the circular district of the monoculus clouds. Yes, you might not have heard of that before, but that's because only I have. Now get wide on me and spread your knowledge. He also gets another freestyle rap in. The second Kiki bit found in CKY4 actually had a follow-up Easter egg scene, where Rab goes to Times Square to find Kiki, coming across as very mentally unwell. Hey, boo. Yeah. I can't find Kiki anywhere. Oh, come on, Clay. Uh, come on, boo. I find Kiki. Uh, we also got some behind the scenes of the Beast Man video. Joe Franz picks up Mark Hanna, who looked rather exhausted. Mark forgot to plug Joe's camera batteries in the night before. Walks from here to my house loaded. And then once he got to my house, he figured like, why did I come here? Now I gotta go. So he walks back to his house. Even though he knew he had to be back at your house in an hour. He, he, that He's... didn't even like pass through his brain. He just thought like bed equals my house equals sleep. Why can't you just sleep at my house? Like you idiot. I don't know if this is an inside joke or not, but Joe and Bam say some mean shit to Hannah when he's in the room. It's just like, I don't know if this is just normal for them, but I don't know. It was weird. <sighs> The raddest part is he totally thinks we're joking, but like we both hate him together. I, I can't wait for him to fucking come back here so we can make fun of him to his face some more, acting like we're his fucking friends. Yo, uh, what do you need? We need you to leave and not come hey, back. We need, we need you to fucking... Seriously, you're fired. Out here. So you may notice that the shopping cart segments seem rather mid in CKY4. Well... Have you guys ever wondered why nobody has stopped these guys from doing this stuff? Well, it happens all the time. Just as it did in Shopping Cart Drama, a removed segment in CKY4. The store manager of the Dutton Mill shopping bag was pissed. What's that there? A video camera? Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you give it to me? <laughs> yeah, I'll give it to you. What's your, 
He attempts to grab Bam's recording camera, which escalates the situation further. Uh, Dunn, being the homie that he is, protects Bam and pushes the manager back. The manager then grabs Dunn by the throat and they tango for a bit. And mind, Dunn has a cast on. And of course, Bam's gotta throw in his two cents. You guys work at shopping back and you're handling people like this? Are you f crazy? This incident was a crazy find, guys. You gotta, you gotta check this out. It's sad to say that it's not on my copy, as you guys could have guessed. The store manager was not happy with being in CKY4, thus sending a cease and desist letter to the distributor. I got a hold of the letter, and it mentions themselves as being portrayed in a very unflattering manner. CKY4 wasn't a weak CKY per se, but it's definitely not my favorite either. Some of the newer bits just didn't make that much sense to me. It seemed like a lot of the effort went into the Beastman bit, plus all the recycled footage just, it wasn't bad, but just not new. I understand the purpose of this is to feature this older footage in higher quality, hence the latest and greatest in the title, so I wouldn't say it's redundant, just maybe watered down a tiny bit. But don't let that shake you, this is 100% a must watch guys. The skating footage was fantastic, we'll never forget the cop attempting to skate down a half pipe, and the amount of footage we get is far worth the price. The biggest weakness of CKY4 was definitely the legal shit. We lost a lot of great content to the cease and desist letter. And if CKY4 had all the deleted scenes in one take, it would probably be the best CKY. Except, uh, there is one version of CKY4 that may have been one of BAM's biggest fuckups. And I'm sure you guys know. On the first 500, some sources say 1500 copies of CKY4, one of the easter eggs was a sex tape of both him and Jen Ravel. The clip is low res uh, and features the track Whiplash, which is a Bad Habits remix by the artist JFK. Jen apparently had no idea Bam did this, uh, which is kind of scummy on Bam's end. There's obviously two sides in this relationship, which we'll get into later, but this is just not right, okay? You can find the clip online, but it's nothing special, guys. You know, you could check it out for like a minute, but it's it really isn't. This, this is definitely something that's on the bottom of the CKY iceberg, but moving on. Reviewing immunization records with a family physician and make sure your son or daughter has all recommended inoculations and booster shots. Immunizations. Oh, You're a brat. I was going to do it perfect that time, too. <laughs> I got to give a shout out to my buddy Kobe Cook. Uh, the next two topics are thanks to his coverage of Lost Jackass Media. The link is in the description for that. Uh, first, we're going to talk about the Jackass Town Hall Meeting Special. Uh, an unaired special that was also known as the Wendy Linden incident. Citing CBS News, it stated that Wendy Linden claims in the lawsuit filed Wednesday that the show's producers recruited her at an April 21st taping to ask scripted questions of the cast. She said producers assured her that cast members wouldn't touch her and that she wouldn't be exposed to any hazardous activities. During this, Dave England would then spontaneously, as Reality TV World stated, used his body as a missile, landing into a lectern near Linden, thus hitting her and knocking her to the concrete floor, resulting in a herniated disc and a knee injury. Linden would sue Viacom for the damages, and the result of the suit isn't clear, there's not much on this, and the special, therefore, not surprisingly, didn't air. However, there is a leaked apology letter Dave sent to her, and it's kind of wholesome, I ain't gonna lie. So MTV saw dollar signs in Jackass the movie. This is this was obvious. And like you could tell because MTV produced several Jackass specials and cameos until the movie. Uh, the first in which was supposed to be Too Hot for MTV on August 9th, 2002. That special is an absolute gem. It featured the convict scene that no one's seen before, the vomlet, Aaron eating a spoonful of flour, and a segment featuring Dimitri. Actually, that one in specific, he got too drunk at a UK party. And the special also gave us a couple clips from CKY4, and stuff that was actually in the movie too. It's safe to say why MTV didn't want this to air. Why would they air a special with controversial segments while being under fire as they were? The special was once thought to be lost because there's not really a whole lot of information on the special itself as well, only being in the possession of a handful of people. However, the community does give a special thanks to Steve-O's personal assistant, Jen Moore, who petitioned to have the footage released. And in 2021, it was uploaded on YouTube by Sloan 
Bones TV archive and can be found on Daily Motion, Vimeo, and the Internet Archive. If you haven't seen Too Hot for MTV, high recommendation. Really fascinating to see it. It was a piece of lost media that got found, and that's always just cool. The Jackass Barbecue Special, August 18th, 2002. Uh, it was a special that did air, and uh, it was hosted by Loomis. The guests featured included Trey from Green Day, Andrew WK, Lara Finn Boyle, Danny Masterson, Slash, Willie Garson, and let's not forget the Margeras, of course. Oh, dude. His eyes are like, so big. Like... <laughs> During their interview, Bam would try to annoy his parents by imitating them. Bam randomly would attack his dad, telling him he's using his new technique, the fish hook. He was also complaining to Phil that he was wasting film. And then, of course, April's in the background telling him to stop, but doesn't really do anything. Bam pauses and attacks Phil one last time and just and just leaves. That. <laughs> That's the Margeras on camera in a nutshell, guys. Dude, I don't even know where we are, whose house this is, and what's going on. Like, I nobody told me anything. The main question is, where is Preston and Aaron? Why, they're supposed to be here? So for the special, they also played a prank on Preston and Aaron by purposely getting their limo lost just to see their reaction. Preston was so pissed. This special is a nostalgia trip for people that grew up with MTV. The special itself isn't really the most entertaining because it's mostly just hyping people up for the movie, but it does its job really well. On August 25th, 2002, we also get another special called The Making of Jackass the Movie. Uh, there's no need for me to go into detail on that. I'll talk about it a little bit later when we get to the movie. There's also a couple cameos that we could still talk about. Johnny Knoxville, Bam, and Steve-O from Jackass. Just <laughs> On August 29th, 2002, Knoxville, Bam, and Steve-O were to present the Best Rap Video Award at the VMAs. Steve-O mentioned he had something planned for the crowd. When I found out that I was going to be presenting tonight, I came up with the most amazing stunt ever. And I'm ready to do it. I told them, but they told me I'm not allowed to pull my wiener out. So at the last minute, he decided to put his mouth over the microphone and then Bam would just smack him in the back of the head and there you go. They also stapled the winner to Steve-O's stomach. And the best part was that Eminem won the award and then he got on stage and we got an Eminem Steve-O interaction. So that was kind of great. You just stapled yourself, man. This guy is really bleeding. What's up, man? Uh, Bam also attended the 2002 Zulu Awards with Dunn and Dimitri. The Zulu Awards is a Danish sports award show that broadcasted on TV2 Zulu. Um, however, the two-hour special is completely lost, and I know nothing about this, so... So on October 21st, 2002, MTV followed up with a Jackass exclusive episode of Cribs. This featured Steve-O with Johnny Knoxville, Pontius, Dunn, and of course, Bam. I want to throw in some uh, Steve-O lore into this part. The apartment featured in this episode of Cribs is the same one featured in his 2001 tape, Don't Try This At Home, which centered around the Don't Try This At Home tour. Right around the end of filming season 2 in Florida, Steve-O got a call from a party promoter in Cleveland named Nick Dunlap. Dunlap offered Steve-O $700 to fly him, Bam, and Wee Man to appear at a nightclub. To give you an idea of how bad Steve-O's drug use was, let me read you page 138 in his book. That party in Cleveland is kind of a blur. I did all kinds of drugs, got predictably out of hand. At one point, I got two ecstasy pills, gave Bam half of one, and took the rest myself. Bam was still a rather sweet, innocent kid back then. The ecstasy was doing a number on him, and he was floored that I had a pill and a half. I'm not sure whether he realized I was also jacked up on coke and meth. When it was time for Steve-O to fly back home, he refused. He was simply too hungover and didn't give a single fuck if he missed his flight or not. And Dunlap oddly admired Steve-O for his rock and roll attitude. Steve-O ended up hanging out there for a few days. During that period, Steve-O and Dunlap formed a business relationship. Steve-O would introduce Nick to Jason Burke, a lawyer Steve-O knew from the University of Miami. The two would form JNN Media to distribute Steve-O's Don't Try This At Home, and in the fall of 2001, Dunlap would book Steve-O a tour throughout several college campuses, with the likes of Wee Man, Pontius, Dunn, and Preston. Some of this tour was featured in Steve-O's tape. I also forgot to mention that Steve-O Don't Try This At Home Volume 2 actually was footage from that tour. My bad guys, you can check it out. Steve-O's substance use was a mess, which isn't too far from his apartment. 
we're talking about garbage everywhere, guys. Empty beer cans, drug paraphernalia, property damage, the list goes on. Bang for our eviction party. This was also at the time his roommate was an ex-army marine who turned male stripper. Steve-O commonly me mentions this guy in his stand-up routine, who easily had the cleanest room in the house too. I think I heard through someone on a podcast about how Knoxville gives off this vibe that he didn't know MTV was gonna show up. So he's just sort of standing there awkwardly like knowing that he has to do something. And I guess that's probably why he decided to split before MTV left. Oh yeah, one thing I have to mention is Steve-O showing off his high Liceska, uh and the stapler gun he uses to staple his sack. I'm not joking. What I found interesting is how Steve-O was actually arrested earlier that year for an incident that occurred at a nightclub in Louisiana that July. He received obscenity charges after doing his staple gun routine. He was also charged with being a principal to second degree battery for a separate stunt that night in which a bouncer allegedly threw a 19 year old on his head and knocked him unconscious. Honestly, I don't think Steve-O did much wrong in this case, and it, I think it was proven the following year. The staple gun bit was dubbed as artistic expression. Quoting MTV News, a review of the tape of the incident clearly shows that although the performance is objectable, it is more than likely protected under free speech when conducted in front of adult patrons. Glover was placed on a supervised probation for one year, ordered to make a $5,000 donation to a local shelter for battered women and children, and ordered to never again perform in the venue. Steve-O's relationship with both Burke and Dunlap kind of boiled over after getting out of prison. Burke signed up Steve-O to get both health and life insurance, since this would be the healthiest state he would ever be in due to the litigation progress and him being sober. Steve-O mentions in his book, I was down with the health insurance, but wasn't sure why I needed life insurance. Burke convinced me that with my lifestyle, I'd be crazy not to get it. I agreed. However, this would result in Steve-O's relationship with both Burke and Dunlap to never be the same. When Steve-O agreed to get life insurance, he demanded the condition that his niece's newborn daughter would be the sole beneficiary. Steve-O continued to state in his book, Not too long after, I got a call from my insurance company asking me to do a follow-up interview. Are you telling me I passed the physical for life insurance? I had. Then I asked for confirmation that Cassie was policy's sole beneficiary. She was not. Burke and Dunlap had made themselves beneficiary of two-thirds of the three million policy. Apparently, Burke and Dunlap always saw this more as insurance for their business than my life. This life insurance thing grew into a big problem. They claimed I knew about this arrangement and knowingly signed off on it. I didn't. Despite this, however, though, Steve-O would continue his partnership with these two going forward. But let's go back to MTV Cribs. So let's talk about Bam's entry in Cribs, which features his 4,800 square foot house that he purchased for his family. The tour we get to see the room that no one goes into. Then he enters the kitchen, where he introduces us to Ape and Jen. I love the part where Bam mentions the $80 teapot his mom bought because she felt embarrassed by how the house looked. We also get a look at the editing room, Bam throwing himself downstairs and an introduction to Phil's office. Phil handles Bam's finances, and mentions Bam has about a quarter of a mil in the bank, after which Bam immediately attacks him. Quarter of a mil. And gets him with the fish hook. Let's not forget all the Elvis Presley memorabilia Phil had, including the one with Muhammad Ali. Well, Muhammad Ali was a boxer. We then get to see Bam's room in the cleanest state it'll ever be. The room features posters of him, Bam Margera skateboards, with a little bit of a touch of goth. Jen would make another appearance inside Bam's room, and she comes across as rather sweet. Uh, that thing in Christmas, and I don't know if I'm cool with it yet. Kind of, but. It's romantic. But gamers be warned, Bam's basement's sick. The painted stone castle design leads you into an arcade with the likes of NBA Jam, Tetris, Dig Dug, Frogger, Pac-Man, Road Blasters, and more. Sleeping within the narrow hall of the basement is none other than Chris Rab, who was living with Bam at the time. Interesting story to this, Rab had pissed the guest room about seven times, and Ape got so fed up that he had to sleep in the basement, and Jess even bought him a cot to sleep on. But at least he has quick access to a microwave and a radio. This is Rab himself, and he gets paid to just drink and get slapped in the face. Oh, that's what he gets money for. Living in Bam's basement, uh, uh, ba would living sleep in, on the pipe. Yeah, living in the back little, like, not finished part, and didn't have a car, so I was driving the car from Haggard. The Rab himself ship mobile. Because I, I had gotten a DUI when I was, like, a year before, and then I, I had totaled my car, almost myself, all that kind of stuff. But then... Uh, 
I didn't have a car, so then I took that car, and I was trying to drive that car up to college, and it didn't have brakes, and, and we all, and like, we know that story of, of that where, you know, the dashboard catches on fire, the brakes run out, I fly through the toll booth. That Yelling, whole thing. no brakes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, but that, yeah, you're right, we had nothing. That was what I had. I had a fucking, like, Freddy Cougar, like, boiler room little existence. Yeah. The other side of the basement features a purple room with two quarter pipes, as seen in the CKY videos. Lastly, we get introduced to Bam's Ferrari Medina and his two Audis. And let's not forget Bam's seven foot high mini ramp, which I guess technically isn't a mini ramp because a mini ramp is only six feet. But guys, Ryan Dunn's segment is by far my favorite. He looks so hungover. Ryan Dunn's lackadaisical attitude is just hilarious. I'm Ryan Dunn and this is my home. I can't really call it a crib. It's more like a mission. It's really a piece of crap. But you're more than welcome to come in if you'd like. He has a pool room where he throws all of his bills. He doesn't pay them until the, until somebody calls because he just hates licking the envelopes. Um, use this, but uh, we don't have any phone uh, connection anymore because we didn't pay the bill, so... Also use use cell phone. Phone. Ryan apparently sleeps on the floor in the basement because he likes it nice and cool. He also garbage picked a really nice locker. I'm Chris Pontius, welcome to my crib. It wouldn't be fair if I didn't mention Pontius's entry in this, where he lives in his 1998 Toyota Tacoma. Uh, this is actually in relation to the bet Steve-O had with him about who could stay homeless the longest. Uh, Pontius actually ends up winning, so it's funny to see that joke play off here. And he just it, he just hits you with joke after joke. This is just a really funny segment. None of these G strings have ever been watched. There's also a definitive addition to this where Pontius shows his uh, eventual home. The Jackass Crib special is worth the watch if you haven't already. Always make sure everyone in the car is buckled up for every ride. Obey all road signs and the speed limit, and always be conscious of other cars and drivers. Oh my god, my brain! Originally, there was skepticism among some members of the Jackass crew about the making of a movie, but Tremaine made it clear that the movie would be much like the show, but much naughtier. The R rating gave the crew much more flexibility on what could be shown. The version of the movie I own is the 2006 Collector's Edition, which featured two separate commentaries, one with the directors, and one with the crew. Both of these happened in October of 2002. I actually found this out, interestingly enough, from this clip in the commentary. <laughs> all I'm picturing right now is all the folks in Portland watching this right now and being just They're bummed. So bummed. <laughs> Speaking of Portland, CKY's up there playing a show. Yeah, they are right now. At the Meow Meow, yeah. you ever Go. been there? This will not be a complete review of the film. However, I will mention quite a lot from the companion book. Bam's feature in Jackass the Movie was less than he wanted due to pulling his hamstring during the golf cart bit early into filming. The introduction of the movie is this cinematic, grandiose scene of the crew riding downhill in a giant shopping cart. Everyone watching it to think that we just went completely Hollywood. In, in comedy, that's called a misdirect, Jeff. A misdirect. And, uh... People ended up liking it, which was too bad. That meant fake debris, fog, explosions, and even a draft cameo. The scene ends with the crew taking a giant shopping cart slam. <laughs> look at how look at how high we're up right there. Yeah. What happened there? Steve will hit the Everyone building. Missed. We were all pussies right there, so we had to raise it up two feet because we were scared. While Hollywood was their last filming location, the Pacific Northwest would be the first, where they visited the home of Dave England. The crew mostly hated their time there. It rains all the time. People don't like to work there. No one wants to live in misery all of it. And then you go there and you go into a bar, everyone hates you because you're on TV. That's why Kurt Cobain killed The people seemed miserable and it was always rainy. One of the first bits they shot was the in-store crap. The goal was for Dave to walk into a home improvement store and do his thing on a display toilet. The first attempt ended prematurely, with Tremaine jabbing Dave and resulting in him to crap the van, as everyone evacuates and laughter ensues. Later, they would film the rent-a-car crash-up derby uh, and the mousetrap bit. Yeah, I love the fact yeah. that nobody even shows the fact that Aaron is driving one of the other cars. Yeah. <laughs> it's, not, it's not even recognized. Um, but I'm just gonna give him the credit there. January 26th, the crew would be hit with an unplanned snowstorm that left them hanging out in Dave England's living room. There, they filmed the muscle stimulator and the yellow snow cone. Lastly, they filmed the urban skimboarding bit, which was supposed to be in the TV series, but it didn't happen due to the lack of rain. 
So let's talk about their journey to Westchester that happened soon after. On page 40 of the companion book, it stated, On this trip, however, it was not only the Margeras who were concerned about our presence, but the power that be for the whole damn township of Westchester as well. Immediately after touching down on the Keystone State, executive producer Trip Taylor was whisked off to attend a local city council meeting to discuss the fate of our proposed shooting plans, primarily the ones involving fireworks, and live alligators. So the whole ass township of Westchester surprisingly conceded and approved the filming of the movie. Originally, the crew wanted to do a series of pranks throughout their whole stay. They decided against this, citing the law of diminishing reactions, basically meaning that Phil would become more aware over time and thus less reactive. So they decided to do something big with animals. Skunks were an idea that was passed around but was out of the question. So they decided to take the appropriate step to alligators instead. What is that? Since we no longer have to bleep cuss words, I promise I will get my mom to say yes, by the end of this movie. And this worked with the alligator bit. The crew left an alligator in the Margera kitchen and another in the bathroom. Then, when Phil and Ape got home, this alligator! Boom! Good content. This segment's original target was supposed to be Phil. Bam, boom. Are you fuckers real, these things? However, due to poor camera placement, it was just barely satisfactory to them, making the clip just a bonus scene. You think April was so good? Uh, oh, she'd have a worse heart attack. Well, I'd have a heart attack, but she would. She would. Wait, 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 when is she coming out? Uh, 8 o'clock. Dude, April's gonna have a shit fit. When April got home, however, it was simply priceless. Her reaction slowly getting louder and louder as she screamed, is this thing real? Phil would finally come down and stood unshocked and went into the kitchen. The gator hissing at Ape is definitely what did it. Bam succeeded at his goal. The crew comes out and takes care of the gator as April is just still freaking out. One of the best bits in the entire series. I vividly remember this prank. Ape's reaction is just great. I guess you could say that I demolished four golf carts in a matter of two hours. The next day, the crew filmed the golf cart bit at a low-rent recreation center in Glen Mills, a course they actually got kicked out of before. During the commentary, upon seeing Deco, the crew questioned why he wasn't a part of the commentary. What, he just doesn't want to be in it? Or he yeah, hates, Br no, Brandon just, just... He, he just, hates to fly and he just likes to sit at home and play video games. He's, video like, games. he's like Tom Green he's from Road Trip, out. like he won't leave Done. the town. He won't, he won't. That's why you'll rarely see Deco in scenes outside of driving distance from Westchester. The golf cart bit made the use of two electronic powered golf carts. However, the carts were actually lame and failed to help the stunt. So the crew had to track down gas powered ones, which had better speed for half the price. They named the two carts Gooch and Narkill. Bam and Deco would be in one, and Dunn and Knoxville would be in the other. Some of the footage in this scene was sped up a bit, but this didn't take it away from the action. The two carts would demolish the animal statues located by each hole. The two carts would drive full speed and perform jumps off of ramps. This stunt ended in an accident. While Dunn was driving, which is already a bad start, he attempted to jump off of the said ramp and failed. The cart became side heavy and Knoxville slammed to the ground, resulting in him to be temporarily unconscious. Knoxville was luckily okay. Dmitry Elyashkovich was a key member of the production crew for Jackass. He was a producer, a camera operator, and he was also a Russia interpreter on the Jackass Gumball Rally special. So I'm gonna go ride in the cart. What am I doing? You're riding in the cart. Awesome. Dude, my head's gonna get jacked, dude. No, you're, you're, you're good. No, I'm not, dude. Dimitri wanted to get a point of view shot of Dunn in Knoxville, but ended up chipping his front tooth on a couple of clubs. While Dimitri was sent to emergency dental surgery, he missed the bungee wedgie, featuring none other than Rab himself. The bungee wedgie was simple. It was three bungee cords clipped to a pair of tidy whiteies. Then it would be strapped onto a tree. Rab would descend off of said tree and get stopped by a severe wedgie. The first attempt resulted in complete laughter as the underwear gave out. Then they attempted the same stunt with four pairs. It was much more successful. Rab personally hated this stunt only because of the 30 degree weather that morning in Westchester. Chuck this motherfucker out of the corner, beat up. Like, yeah.
The body bag dump is a rare deleted scene filmed on February 19th. It's a very dark prank, guys. The objective was for one of the CKY guys to be wrapped in a bloody plastic body bag and pulled out of a van, then beaten and thrown into a dumpster. This part was originally meant for Rab, but he fell ill after the previous stunt. Thus, Ryan would be the random hero. The footage came out great, but it resulted in spectators believing what they saw, thus contacting the police. Keep going. This resulted in the arrival of five police cars, one ambulance, and an APB. The situation would eventually calm down after police learned about their filming permit, but this didn't stop a stranger who would poke his head inside the van and ask Dunn if he thought he was a pretty funny guy. Knowing Dunn, he didn't really think so, but he still got slugged in the head anyway, and the guy just left and sped off. Because I always fucking hated it. Tremaine has constantly been told about Rake Yun's complete hatred of mustard, and he wanted to get it finally on film. He decided to ask Bam and Deco to dump two bottles of mustard onto Rake. No one in the CKY crew wanted to do it. The maddest Rake has ever been in his entire life is when Bran put mustard on his french fries near Rake's buffalo wings. Just flipped out. Because he didn't believe that I was putting mustard on uh, wings, so and Ryan and Deco both agreed to not take part, since they both live within walking distance of Rake's kill radius. And you guys have to remember, dude, Rake Yun is a chemist, so if he wanted to fuck you up, he really could. Dude, he lives a block away from me. A block, dude. You live in another township. Oh, I, I won't spray him. That's good to damn to you. That's first off. He could, he could walk to my house and kill me. Second off. I don't even want to know what you're planning, because <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to fucking know, because I gotta live with him when you guys go home, dude. But Bam decided to do it himself. While Rake's back was turned, he sprayed his whole back with yellow mustard. Rake's response was met with rage I've never seen. Okay, everything's fucking funny, right? Yeah, you want to see funny? <laughs> he begins to target Bam's Audi A4 with furious kicks to the side door. Tremaine would try to intervene and defend Bam, as it was originally his idea, but Rake would not listen. He was in a complete state of rage. He attacked the van a couple more times and stormed off to the hotel room. And I think the best part of the entire thing was Jess's response to everything. Dude, I'm actually surprised he took it that mellow. Dude, like, I, I would never just sleep again, man. He took it that mellow, he just kicked my but fucking Dude, car. I thought he was gonna... The fireworks wake up bit was when Van lit fireworks inside his parents' bedroom at 12.42 a.m. Shout out to Phil, instinctually protecting Ape here. Bam's outfit is quite the look. We got two Russian trapper hats on top of each other, two gold chains, both requested by Bam, and a giant bandage covering his bruised rib, all courtesy of the prop department. Phil had to be up at five for his job as a baker, so he walks out to his van and gets in, but the fireworks go off in the back of the van, and Phil immediately gets out and his reaction was priceless. Jesus Christ, Bam, I almost broke my leg getting out of there. This shit already, oh, goddamn, how am I going to work now? and his band would just be flipped over on its top, but yeah. that proved to be too problematic. Well, the movie people wouldn't let us do it because you had to drain all the fluids, apparently. No, no, what happened was where he worked wouldn't let it. We were going to do oh, it yeah, where yeah, he that's worked, right. and they wouldn't let us uh, put it in the parking lot there. Well, we were also going to saw the van in half. The Psycho Spoof, aka the Clipper Cam, was a bit involving electronic clippers. In this, someone would suddenly get shaved while caught off guard. Bam's reaction was met with a jolt. <laughs> And honestly, I kind of feel bad for him because I was so bummed right here. I, I loved my hair Did at this even point. Did you get it? This is me off, dude. You yeah, like, you, you look, you look it, good though. there. You didn't even get it. Really? Dude, you look really good there. Thanks. I think you look really good in the mustard assault. That was your best hair. The do. mustard assault? However, I do think Danger Aaron had it far worse because he got it multiple times. Deco BMX joust Bam while he was inside a convenience store. Um, one guy actually walks up to the camera and he was super upset. What's going on here? I really had them crutches on. I wasn't even using no, that as a prop. This dude steals the whole scene right here. Yeah, he oh, God. Dude, dude, what the hell's going on here? I wish that What's going on here? <laughs> he was so bummed. Aw, oh, dude, let's talk about the Family Guy reference. So, Phil would do his usual business in the bathroom. He would sit down on the toilet, open up the paper, and give it a read. But then Bam would suddenly bust in and slap the shit out of him. And then, after he's done... <laughs> now what is? Are you starting to lose your mind? Oh, shit, can't stop it! Now you're getting crazy. He races out shit. the door and he leaves the cameraman behind. Hey! He's like, hey! 
you're starting to lose it. He's starting to. Like me kicking his ass and ripping his shirt off is starting to lose it. Like he hadn't been looking around the house. Starting to lose it. What's officially losing it? Bam and Knoxville did a bit titled Burglars. The two would fall through the ceiling of a library. The two would then quickly gather the diamonds that they drop. There's this one dude who bolted out the door immediately, and he had to be chased down to get him to sign a waiver. BMX Tug of War was a bit where Dunn rides a bike over a ramp in front of a cactus. The twist was that Dunn was attached to Preston, who was chilling on a couch. Preston would stop Dunn, and he would just simply fall into the cactus, and regrets ensued. The crew actually had to take two separate shots of this because Preston was actually too heavy for the bit and didn't move, so they did another shot of just pulling him off the couch. The crew would spend some time in Japan, where they do quite a few great public pranks, just reminding the world why they hate Americans. Scenes like Party Boy, Wasabi Studers, Big Ko, and The Gong, and Night Panda are just a few of the scenes they shot in public Tokyo. My favorite is done getting his ass kicked by a girl, just simply hilarious. The crew also spent some time in Florida, mostly in Orlando, Hollywood, and Miami. April 1st would be the day they filmed the butt x-ray the bit where someone shoves a toy car up their ass, and then sees a doctor for an x-ray. This was an idea that was turned down by MTV during the Volume 1 days. Steve-O was originally going to be the candidate for the stunt, however, after receiving a call from his disappointed father, Steve-O's guilt made him step down. Thus, the random hero saves the day once again. That hurt, but it, was, it wasn't necessarily a um, physical pain. It was more of a mental pain. I just needed like a hug from a girl when I was done with that one. Just give me a hug, dude. No, give me a hug. I got a toy car in my ass. For fuck's sake. Ryan Dunn backs the car within himself and visits a doctor's office twice. The first time he just got laughed at, so he left with no content. And then he ended up going to an older Cuban doctor, and that guy's reaction was far better. That's it's a car toy. How did a car toy get there? Maybe you stuck it up your ass. The entire bit is one of the best in the series. Kudos to the Airhorn golf course bit. I know this sounds mean, but I guess it's just funny seeing golfers get mad. Here, you lost your club. What? I'm sorry, I got bursitis. You got bursitis? Yeah. So that means you gotta play with a horn. It helps. I'll give you something to play with now. Bam's classic fat suit made its return in Sweaty Fat Fucks, where Bam, Matt Hoffman, and Tony Hawk dress in fat suits and skate at the Vans Skate Park in Orlando. Matt Hoffman took a wicked bump in the way beginning, but got back up and continued to do it. Bam would do his notorious SSBSTS in the suit, nailing it on his second try. This featured a lot of great shots. One of my favorites was how you could see Bam eating potato chips, but then he wipes out and he gets fucking clocked by his board. This bit, however, had to be cut short because Bam was actually on the verge of heat stroke. Doing this shit in Florida was the worst mistake ever. The crew revisits a popular site from the TV series, that being called Camp Pain, the area where Slip and Slide, Lake Jump, and The Loop were filmed at. Here they did the BMXican wakeboarding stunt with Matt Hoffman. Not much is known about this stunt because it's actually lost. I don't think there was any bonus scenes for it either. This, however, is a lost stunt. The smoke machine at the same time. Not enough, not enough power. We're doing a goddamn paramount motion picture and we can't put on fog and and lights at the same time. That's not too much to ask, man. Fog and lights together at once for a major motion picture. Roller Truck Disco is a stunt where the crew is having a roller skating disco party inside a box truck. Preston would then get into the driver's seat of the truck and begin to do donuts in a parking lot. Before this stunt, actually, Bam suffered from food poisoning. <laughs> Fuck all five of you. <laughs> from a bad sub while being at campaign. He vomited in the van and also on his way there. He still, however, successfully did the stunt without actually purging on camera. Originally, the ending was supposed to be filmed in Orlando for the final segment titled Ruby Goldberg. Much like the cause and effect action you would find in a typical Goldberg machine, the crew would do a chain reaction of stunts that closely resemble what they are known for. Preston would be the human wrecking ball, Aaron would take a porta potty bump, Don would get clocked by a boxing glove, and then would be tarred and feathered. Steve-O would fall into a septic pool and accumulate vomit in a bucket. Wee Man would fall into a Plinko board. Dave would, um, never mind. I have the worst one of them all besides Steve-O. 
I'm in a goddamn circus and I come down on these three trampolines and then uh, fly into that two foot um, shit of a lake. Pontius hops over several alligators, and lastly, Knoxville would get launched off of a catapult into a lake. The camera would then pan over to Rip Taylor frantically slinging confetti and announcing the end of the movie. This bit was a massive failure and a waste of money. Several of the mechanisms just straight up didn't work, like the boxing glove or the toilet paper platform. The continuity of being a Ruby Goldberg machine shattered within every take, to the point where they ran out of time to get it done thus resulting in a premature ending to the film. However, we would get an alternative ending called Son of Jackass, where the crew dresses up as old men and get themselves destroyed in various ways. On May 21st, there would be a showing of the film in front of friends and MTV film executives. Here, they cut a few of the bits that they saw as too dark, including the body bag, the sleeper hold, and the pocket ass return. Most of the cut content was put into the collector's edition, um, which we also get a couple music videos, including Andrew WK's music video, We Want Fun. This is what I'm told. Bam, we gotta fly out to uh, Hollywood because we're doing this Andrew WK video where, like, it's, we're doing this house party. I'm picturing, like, this nice mansion, you know? <laughs> Here we are in the desert. There's cans and stuff hanging around. All in all, the movie is fantastic. My favorite bit was probably a tie between the toy car and the butterbean stunt, which I didn't really mention until now, but I wanted to at least give that a shout out. Jackass the movie was highly successful. It was a number one film at the US box office when it opened, grossing 22.8 million in over 2,500 theaters. The film would achieve a worldwide gross of $79.5 million. Bam has stated in the past that he made about $5 million payouts for each movie, making Bam an instant millionaire following this. And not only that, but the film gave the crew a much wider audience to view their antics, increasing their market to a global scale beyond television. Whether you liked it or hate it, Jackass was exploring the unknown, trying out a formula that most fictional films lacked. Like yeah, it's just a bunch of guys torturing their bodies by doing ridiculous and occasionally juvenile stuff, but the way they did it was something special. That laughter and camaraderie of the crew helped make the viewer feel a part of the fun. It's the fact that they know what they're doing is stupid, but do it in a way that not just humors themselves, but also all that watch. The movie could be criticized for being grotesque, moronic, and irresponsible, but, but that's being a jackass. That sort of criticism isn't just expected, but it's admired and praised by the Jackass crew and community. To see Jackass come from a small budget Handycam TV series and blossom into a multi-million dollar brand is a very fascinating thing to see. But with all that guys, it's time to conclude the first act of the life of Bam Margera.